in my 20 minutes, I want to zip through some of the dramas in the energy space and hopefully end on an upbeat note after some quite depressing stuff. So the true cost of energy. Let's start with the financial crisis because neuroscience as a discipline has been growing in understanding in leaps and bounds in recent years and everything that happened through the um, nightmare of the financial crisis in 2008, the precursor in 2007, really doesn't, doesn't surprise quite a few of the professionals in the neuroscience vocation. They talk about us having uh, a predictable irrationality as individuals and groups in the way that we think and make decisions. They talk about our incumbency effect our endowment effect is their, their technical term for it, whereby we, we tend to favor things we have that have downsides over things that we mightn't have. So when they look at the financial sector and see uh, a great industry actually making a catastrophic misjudgment about its asset base, they're not surprised. And so I look at the energy industry, which I've been part of for all my working life, and I ask the same question. Could there be similar things going on here, problems of the human condition that result in massive over-evaluation of asset bases? And my answer, of course, is yes, and this won't be a surprise to people who've read the little book that I've written on this, Quick Plug, The Energy of Nations, um, on which much of the rest is based, but uh, there's more up-to-date material in it. I want to talk about the three risks, systemic risks, that I concentrate on in that, in that book. The carbon bubble, the shale surprise, and the oil shock. But I want to start with um, some of the positive stuff. As a backdrop to everything you're going to hear, I'm sure people will be aware of this, having given up their Saturday to come uh, to this occasion, but there are remarkable things happening in clean energy. Look at this headline, global solar dominance in sight as science trumps fossil fuels. Now, this isn't some fringe green website. This is the Telegraph, and the writer is the senior business editor. And what he's talking about is the cost down in solar, which is spectacular. The details here don't matter. Just look at the steepness of that line, which the analysts at Alliance Bernstein, where it comes from, describe as the terror dome. It's the terror dome for the fossil fuel industry because their costs and prices burble along at the bottom there, and there's a selection of them. The details don't matter. And we, since 2006, have got down in among them. Solar today is cheaper than many uses of fossil fuels around the world, and it's going to get more so. And so you see analysts, sensible coherent analysts talking about things like the death spiral for the utility industry business model as a result of what's going on. And it extends beyond just the generation of electricity. It extends into transport because of the parallel cost down in battery technology. This is no surprise to us at Solar Century. This is the development we did near Slough. It's way beyond zero emissions. All the electricity comes from our solar roof tiles on the roofs. Um, and in fact, all the heating comes from renew renewable energy technologies on site as well. But look at the battery car there. The surplus electricity is going into the battery car. Actually, the wire only goes one way. In the future, it'll be going two ways as the car is used as a little storage plant. But this isn't surprising to us. Until recently, it was surprising to UBS. But the most recent report on solar and clean energy um, came out on the 27th of August by the biggest private bank in the world. And look what they're saying. UBS urges investors to join the solar revolution. And they now calculate that you can have an electric vehicle, a solar roof, and a bank of batteries in your home. And that by 2020, you will be looking at a payback of six to eight years on your capital investment on that and an annual rate of return on avoided costs of seven and a half percent. And that you can't get from the bonus cultists on the high street and you can't even get it from Triodos Bank. So this is going to change the face of the energy industry. They're now saying these deeply conservative investment bankers, and it's being reflected in the conservative press as well. Here he goes again. 20th of August, oil industry on borrowed time. 
our switch to gas and solar accelerates. We'll talk about gas in a minute. I mean, there are days I have to pinch myself when I wake up and open my computer and see stuff like this to check that I've genuinely woken up and I'm not dreaming because for 25 years I've been working on this stuff feeling like I've been bashing my head on a brick wall and now it's happening and it's happening so fast it takes your breath away and big companies are picking up on, on it. You will have all seen these ads from Apple. They're now solar powering all their data centers and they want every company to copy what they're doing. So revolution is in the air and if you want to follow the drama uh, do have a look at my website because I try and keep it up to date with all these things that I have the privilege of, as a non-executive chairman of, um, of, of, of studying every day. So let's zip through these three risks that I want to talk about. The carbon bubble I suspect you all know about. There's basically too much carbon in fossil fuels to burn, way too much to burn. I won't go through the details of this, it's from one of Carbon Tracker's reports, but it shows the statistics for quoted companies in the fossil fuel industries. And basically, you've got two options. If you look at this and you say, well, you know, they can't burn everything they've got as supposed assets, which by the way, they book as though they're at zero risk of impairment whatsoever. Uh, and you can take your money out of fossil fuels, and increasingly people are doing this. Big philanthropic foundations, the churches, the World Council of Churches, the cities, the campuses, something redolent of the boycott campaign um, in the days of apartheid in what's, in what's happening. The doctors recently, the British Medical Association, pulled out of all investment. So you can do that, and that's a powerful tool, and it's a growing tool in the world. It's a problem for the industry, but an even more powerful tool, we believe in Carbon Tracker, is to actually stay invested or keep some of your money invested and put pressure on the annual capital expenditure programs of the fossil fuel industry. And these we have quantified at Carbon Tracker in our 2013 report. Uh, and what you see there in the red circle is the capex going every year to fossil fuels. That's a six trillion dollar punt over 10 years that policymakers will do precisely nothing about climate change. And even if you yourself don't believe in climate change, this is a risk that is being completely ignored in the capital markets and all its processes. And they are very vulnerable on this. They're vulnerable because it's almost incredible the way culturally they keep going. I don't have time to go through all the costs here, but let's just do the one at the top left. And this will come as a surprise if you haven't heard about it. Cash again, it's in, it's in Kazakhstan. In Shell, this is known, of course, as cash all gone because they found this oil field in 2000. They thought they could produce it for $10 billion. That's quite a lot, but you know, doable if they all ganged up together. They thought it would take them five years. So it would come on stream by 2005. In 2013, after many technical problems, it eventually came on stream at a capex bill of $43 billion. Capital expenditure, you know, actually the cost of, of doing the, the stuff, doing the, the operation. So um, uh, at that point, everyone relaxed because oil is being produced and they're going to get their payback. Two weeks later, they had to shut the whole thing down because the oil that they're producing is so toxically acidic that it's eating the pipework. <laughs> so now, you know, and you talk 50 billion here and 50 billion there, pretty soon you're talking serious money, right? Uh, now they've got to fix all the pipes again, somehow to deal with this acidic oil, and um, uh, will they even get this thing up and running? They say it's going to take two years. Arctic oil exploration. Shell began its program in 2013, and what did it do with its first outing? It crashed its drilling rig on the rocks in Alaska, an expensive misadventure. This is what's going on on the frontier. This is what we're up against, and this is why they're in so much trouble. Shale, the shale narrative. This is not going to work. I'm going to make a firm prediction here today. This is a supposed boom. Most people think it is a boom, and it's going to go bust a la financial crisis. Five reasons for this in the UK. First of all, the economics. Um, what you have to do when you're in the shale is drill lots of wells, because the drop-off in production is so fast. It's 80% over three years on average in the shale regions. That's why there are so many abandoned drilling spots there in Texas. Of course, it's desolate Texas. It doesn't matter too much. There's one active one in the, 
in the front right. But this industry is losing money hand over fist because this is expensive drilling. Um, and the top 15 oil and gas players in the shale have so far written off in assets $35 billion. This is all a matter of public record, but just try it out at dinner parties, the number of people that think this is a way to get prosperous, to exploit shale. The net debt accumulated by the top 110 oil companies last year alone was in excess of $100 billion. And it's cultural. They don't know what else to do. They're mostly aging men who've been doing this stuff all their lives. They can't stop. It's like a gambler in a casino. That's what's going on culturally. And it's on the record. It's being noticed. Bloomberg, is the US shale boom going bust? Do the drillers feast on junk debt to stay on the treadmill? Does this remind you of something? It's the mortgage-backed securities business in 2005 and 2006. Second reason it's not going to happen is because of the toxicity of the process. The Bush administration had to, if you don't know this, they had to completely exclude the frackers from the US Safe Drinking Water Act to have it happen. Now those chickens are coming home to roost. A lot of water is being used. A lot of toxic chemicals come in flow back to the surface. They have to be stored in these open ponds. And the stories are beginning to come out. Whole farms poisoned. And what the, what the industry does is buy people off with large sums of money, provided they do a very important thing, which is to sign a gagging order. And this is happening right across the drilling areas in the States right now. This is what Mr. Cameron and Mr. Osborne want to export into Britain. Then it's not going to happen because of the fugitive emissions. The gas industry tell you they're better than coal uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, which they are, if you just measure the burning process. What they don't want you to measure is the amount of methane that leaks. And it leaks everywhere. It leaks from the wellhead. It leaks from the pipelines. It leaks all the way to the hob. Many of us believe that actually gas is going to prove to be worse than, than coal. And um, it, the amount of gas here is, is truly phenomenal, because what you see in that square box is a shale oil drilling region in North Dakota where they just simply flare the gas. They emit it, they emit it to the atmosphere as a carbon dioxide, but they burn it at the wellheads. And you can see it as, from space as though it's a city at night. The um, fourth reason this is not going to work is that it won't be exportable. You can do this stuff in Texas and North Dakota. It's really doubtful whether you can do it in leafy Sussex. Let's just have a look at, this is one mile now. This is a sweet spot in a shale drilling area in Texas, in the Barnett Shale. This is the Weald. Now, I live in the Weald, and there are photos to prove it. I'm taking my dog for a walk. He's broken, <laughs> he's broken his leg, uh, which is very frustrating for a whippet in a bluebell wood full of full of rabbits, so I have to chase them for him. And the caption, <laughs> the caption to the photo on the bottom right is faster, faster. But the point, that's not the point. The point is that if you look across the top uh, pictures, um, the middle distance there is about a mile. So let's just go back and have a look at what that would look like if the shale was actually drilled in the way that Mr. Cameron and Mr. Osborne want. It's clearly just not going to happen. This was the first well they tried to drill in Sussex, not even a fracked well, it's a vertical well to sample the shale to see if it's frackable. There were thousands of pits, Balkan, some of you may have been there, I was certainly there. There were many people on that demo who had never been on a demonstration in their lives, complete, uh, completely clearly and it required half the Sussex police force just to, dr to deliver the drill pipes to the... This is just so not going to happen. And I think they actually know in their hearts uh, and in their minds these fracking companies, and they're just playing share value games to try to hike their share price uh, so that they can sort of get out, make some money, and um, you know, head for the Bahamas. This is the killer reason. This is why it's not going to happen here in this country. These are the lorry movements on an active fracking pad in the States. 
this is water coming in, toxic chemicals coming in. In this country, they'll have to take, they won't be allowed to put all the toxic waste um, on site. They'll have to take it away in tankers as well. It just so clearly is not going to happen. And you wonder who is advising Mr. Cameron and Mr. Osborne. And yet, here are the business models. This is a business leader, the chief executive of Gaz de France Suez. And this is the fifth reason why um, it's very bad. Uh, this is the opportunity cost, because in order to make this happen, they have to oppose what you saw in the Terra Dome and all the things in clean energy. They have to put that in a box, and that's what they're trying to do. There's a civil war going on in the energy industry. I feel it, experience it, live through it every day. These are the kinds of crazy notions that we have to deal with. This man runs a multi-billion dollar country, a company. He thinks gas can do everything heating, electricity, and deal with climate change, because, of course, it's producing less emissions than coal. But to do that, we have to end all subsidies for renewables, put them in their box. We only need them for a few more years in solar. And where is his top prospect for fracking? He can't frack in France. France has banned fracking. Of course, not wholly because they're worried about the environment. They're um, equally worried about the health of their nuclear industry. But anyway, they banned it. Uh, and so where's his top prospect when he's asked the United Kingdom? There is a whiff of madness about this. But this is what we're up against. And there are days when, you know, the, we, writers have this expression, uh, life is often stranger than fiction. And so uh, it appears here because global gas push stalls. That was one day in the Wall Street Journal. You know, journalists are paying attention. They, they look at what's happening. It's not... not rolling out in other countries the way it's supposed to. Uh, and what do we get in the Financial Times? The very next day, Chancellor backs gas to fire up Britain. Unconventional gas, of course. So just finally, a few words about oil. Oil is finite. You would never know it when you listen to the mantras from the oil industry, but this is the production profiles um, in the North Sea. Each one of those pastel shades is a different oil field. You see what happens. You, know, you, know, you find the big ones earlier, and later on in the piece, you find the smaller and smaller ones, and we're well over the peak of production. Bad news for Scotland, or bad news for Britain. Uh, but, you know, this is what happens time and time again. Most oil-producing countries are over the peak of production. How many people know this in the blizzard of mantras that come about the new age of plenty from the oil industry? There's so much gross irresponsibility that comes from this industry. Um, and the, their answer to that kind of diagram that you just saw is, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, there's plenty of oil in Saudi Arabia, and there's plenty of oil in the U.S. shale. Well, I've kind of covered the shale um, in perfunctory detail. Let's just quickly go to Saudi Arabia. Look at the extent of their infrastructure. Um, those scenes on the left are the same place, uh, just a few years apart. So they're building cities in the desert. And in order to do this, they're having to burn a lot of oil in electric power plants because they don't have that much gas in Saudi Arabia. They don't call it the empty quarter for nothing, evidently. So in the blue, you've got um, the consumption domestically. In the gray on the top there, you've got the production of oil in Saudi Arabia, assuming they can maintain it. Let's give them that. And what happens? Uh, the green is where we are today. If they keep consuming domestically at the rate they're doing in recent years, then consumption crosses with exports in the late 2020s. That would be rather inconvenient. Saudi Arabia with not a drop of oil to export. And what are they? They know it's a problem, to be fair. They often talk about it, the royal family and senior officials. And what's their proposed solution? Not more oil, nuclear and solar. And this is the capex going up in red of the top 11 oil companies. And this is their production going down in gray. These are real data, but they try so hard to keep this kind of stuff from the public domain. And the neuroscientists, again, are unsurprised by this. The militaries seem better at spotting the, the threats. Uh, this is true in America. It's true here. It's true in Germany. This is a Bundeswehr report on peak oil risk. Peak oil, however, is unavoidable. It's just that we don't like to talk about it. It's not polite.
at, you know, what's the upside of this? Do I think there's a way out of it? I do. The book is called um, Risk Blindness, which is mostly what I've talked about, but the road to renaissance. And I think there are a number of reasons why we can fashion a road to renaissance. One is the power of context. When leaders see a clear and present danger, which they haven't yet, but they will do when the energy crisis descends, you know, they can act. They did arguably act. Um, in the end game of the financial crisis. The speed at which the survival technologies can be mobilized, those of us on the front lines really know this and experience it every day. That building, uh, that development I showed you earlier, that was put up in a couple of months with our partner, SSE. So there's optimism to be had here in the way my parents' generation mobilized very fast for war when they had to, surprised everyone. The rise of empathy, Jeremy Rifkin's really alluring um, vision of, uh, of the way that we're getting more empathic because of mass communication. Let's hope he's right with that. If he is, then that adds to the prescription for, for hope. And then in my own um, experience, solar century at the top there, you know, the joy of young people in jobs like this, and then the impact of the technology. Each one of those solar lanterns that we distribute in Africa saves an average of 20% of a family like that their income over the course of the year, freeing up um, money for all the other things they can spend it on, education, health, seeds, the, the job. So final picture, this is what looks so daunting about climate change. This is what we have to do if we're going to have a chance of surviving it. We have to deconstruct that line in red going up. We have to make it go down the other way. A lot of people look at that and say, well, it's going to be too difficult, isn't it? I don't think so. When you look at the power uh, of working with the shock, mobilizing, fast and the social structures and strategies would be able to bring together via people power as well as the technologies that are waiting, the green technologies that are waiting to go to replace the ruinous suicidal status quo. You're all going to play a role in that, I know, that's why you're here today. I thank you for that and I thank you for listening to me. Thank you.